Hey, I'm Daniel DK for Banger TV, and today I'm talking to one of my all-time favorite musicians, Thomas Lindbergh from At The Gates. We get philosophical about their new record, The Nightmare of Being. We talk a little bit about the lore of Slaughter of the Soul, and we even get an impromptu unboxing of the new record as it showed up at his front door while we were chatting. Here it is. So Thomas, we're here uh, talking about The Nightmare of Being. It's the seventh record, third back since uh, At War with Reality. I want to set the tone off right away with more of a philosophical question. I've recently heard you refer to yourself as a misanthropic humanist. <laughs> yeah. I want you to elaborate on a little bit about what that means to you and, and how it plays into your role in At The Gates. I have my own little ideas here and there about humanist. I think I'm, I will always be that. Um, but, you know, how the world is looking, I mean, you can't be anything else than misanthropic at the same time. That means I like people, but I just like humanity as a whole. I don't have high hopes for it, basically, you know, and that's kind of what's portrayed on the record, I guess. Well, and, and I, I, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about this pessimism because I think that, you know, you, you can make the statement that this, the, the theme of the record is pessimism. But, uh, you know, the average listener who might not be familiar with that as a philosophical concept, they immediately associate it with being pessimistic or being negative, which is not the case. Um, yeah. can, you, can you tell me a little bit a little bit more about the specific type of philosophical pessimism you're writing about? And I think the idea that, that caught me most was like, as you say, it's not pessimistic at all, really. You know, that's and it's not negative. It's kind of more like a realism basically you know life will have hurt and pain and suffering but if you're always striving you know for not having that and like hoping thinking that you know yeah tomorrow my cancer will be gone or something yeah you will always be disappointed you will always you know feel shit if you embrace life as it is uh, and live with you know no defense mechanisms basically you can live life richer and fuller of course, you will, you know, also embrace the hurt and pain and misery, but it's the fear of those things, those things that hurt the most. The defense mechanism uh, does more damage than it does than it does good on the psyche, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And also, like this defense mechanism can come in different shapes and forms. Could be like the obvious ones: religion, you know, different isms, I guess, you know, world views. It could also be art and other distractions. So, I mean, you don't have to give up all your defense mechanisms, just make peace with them, understand them. I use art as an escape, I do. You know, with the whole pandemic thing, we, we went into a bubble and wrote a record. You know, that, that was our bubble that we escaped to, but we know that, and therefore, we're aware of that defense mechanism. When's the moment when you're like, oh, this isn't just something that is interesting to learn about and read about. I'd love to write a record about this. When, when does that uh, connection happen? I think it is the thing where something triggers me right at the right moment. Jonas was talking a lot musically about what he wanted to do with the record. And I was intrigued with that. And then this concept came up at the right time. And it actually, you know, it clicked so much with the musical approach. And that's, I think, what is necessary. I have some stuff laying around, with, which, you know, we had never done before, which is super interesting. But it has to be the right moment musically, you know. It should be the same emotional approach to the music and the lyrics, something like that. Right. Let's talk about the, the, the music and, and the direction it went on this album. Orchestration, arrangements, instrumentation even. It's both experimental, but if you're an At The Gates fan and you know the roots of the band, it's not unsurprising. But what was the decision process in deciding to take it a step further into those prog and non-metal influences? And uh, how did a performance at Roadburn 2019 help reinforce that decision? I think it's a lot of different things. One of the things, the starting point might be that we already done two combat records, basically. The first one being really like all eyes are on you kind of thing. This is the first one that it's like not so much outside pressure, really. And we also felt that we were slow, like maturing more and more uh, in the songwriting department. We know more about what At The Gates is. So we feel more safe with that. So then we can play with it a little bit more and see like, yeah, but how far can we stretch it? And you can only do that 30 years into the career. You can't do that on the second record. As you said, like there was a lot of prog rock influences in the early days. We didn't have the know-how, how to master it basically. And now we kind of do more at least. <laughs> Uh, and I think the Roadburn, as you mentioned, 
I think you used the word reinforce. That's kind of like the thing. It's like a pat on the back, you know, like, yeah, you could do weird shit, but people will still appreciate it as at the gates. And that's why I said as well, like, if you're a true fan of the band and you've, and you've been on the whole journey, I mean, it's not unsurprising the direction the record went in. You guys are very open about your influences. And I always love hearing musicians talk about their old work. I've heard you say it a million times. Uh, that the early At The Gates records was just trying to fit 200 riffs into one song. Um, this concept of like early prog, but I like how you said we didn't have the know-how. We knew what we wanted to do, but we didn't know how to do it. You know, the 20-year-old youthful arrogance a little bit. You know, we, we're the best musicians in the world. We're going to do this. But like, yeah, but you played guitar for a year. You know, you're not <laughs> going to be Robert Tripp, you know. But it's it's fun, and I like that. But I mean, looking back, of course, I wish we had the know-how, but then those records wouldn't have been done the same way. If you try to play those songs now, you can't play them correctly because then they sound different. Right. They don't sound like the same songs if right. you play them correctly. Yeah, it's, it's different skills, right? Different. It's, uh, it's different people at this point in life, it's 30 years later. For those songs, we know a little bit too much about you know how musical theory actually works. Right. But the, back then we didn't. But I mean, it's you can't fake youthful, uh, pretentious arrogance, you know? So that's why we have to lean a little bit more on the maturity of the band. There's a lot of uh, familiar names on this new record. Uh, anyone from Andy LaRock, uh, Per Stahlberg, uh, Jens Bogren. Why do you continue to work uh, with such um, a similar team? What, what do these people bring to the table that, uh, you know, the unique skill set? And what, what does that add to the At The Gates recipe? We knew that this record was going to be a huge project. It's going to have a lot of different orchestration, as you talked about, like arrangement stuff. We needed someone that could be in control of all those things at once, you know? But we also needed people in the di different studios we recorded it in that had the know-how of how to get that onto tape. For example, Andy LaRock, I mean, he has a great ear. He's a very, you know, talented guitar player. If we have like five things playing at once, he will know how to, you know, arrange that, how, what, which guitar plays, what so it shines through in, in, the, in, the, in the mix kind of thing, you know? And Jens did a lot of that as well. I mean, Jens is so meticulous. So, I mean, that's, that's what, it's his meticulousness we were after basically. It's, you know, you need to hear that lonely little flute, but you also need to hear like the four death metal guitars at the same time. How do you even do that? And, you know, so let's say I'm in pair for the vocals. That's basically, I went back to him, we did the Lurking Fear record with him. Uh, the second one is also recorded with him now. So it's like the guy I could be myself with uh, when I record my vocals, because he's very uh, vulnerable, at least me. I, I use all my emotions when, when I sing. And then you need someone that you can be yourself around, basically. So he's important in that process as well. So everybody has, you know, to say different skill sets that bring out the best of the players, and, you know, make us feel comfortable. We, didn't, we can trust them. Oh, shit. UPS is actually downstairs. Yes. Just give me five seconds. Yeah, you can course. stare at my uh, wallpaper for a bit. Banger TV, this is the second time that we have had a uh, UPS delivery of new records in the middle of an interview. If this is a curse, it's the best curse I've ever experienced. Oh, look, there's a cat. There's a cat. There's a cat. There's a cat. Pss, 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 pss. I'm just curious what it's like to be the at the gates house cat, how the music may have shaped the snacks that you enjoy, whether it affects the way you sunbathe, Insightful. Back. Dude. Sorry about that. I'll open one and see what this is. I have never seen the record. Brand new at the gates record, the nightmare of being. July second, Century Media. Let's see. This is fucking, you know, live on Banger TV. It's happening. There it is. There it is. That's <laughs> awesome. I'm the first fan person to hold this. And you're the first journalist to see it like this <laughs> i mean let's use the term journalist very lightly but uh thank you <laughs> <laughs> i like it though i like it between the record showing up in the middle of the interview and the fact we both showed up to the party wearing accept shirts without planning it yeah it's 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 it's, it's a meant to be day here uh with uh banger tv and tompa 100 percent. this is what we're supposed to be doing today yeah i have you here i have to be a punisher and at least ask one question about slaughter of the soul yeah, no um, worry. Fine. When Sam came to Gothenburg and interviewed you guys for that Metal Evolution episode all about the album, he used an expression, and it kind of slips under the radar in the video, but it really struck me. He says, uh, time honors the greats. 
And I think that's an amazing way to really basically summarize what happened with that record and the band in that period. Do you want to reflect a little bit for me about the way that the the legend or the lore grew while the band was dormant and how you felt about it walking into the reunion versus how you feel about it now, three albums later? Yeah, there's a lot of different feelings, I guess. You know, uh, I think in general, I kind of start to understand what happened now, finally. When we did the reunion, I didn't really grasp how big it was going to be. I had no idea, really. I would maybe feel the same as the listeners a little bit. A band releases like the best record that, you know, they, they've worked their sense themselves onto, and then they split up mysteriously. Of course, that's going to, you know, create like, you know, the word lore that you use is perfect. You know, that's what happened. The record kind of benefited from that a little bit. They're like, you know, did you hear this record? Oh, when can we see them live? No, they're just split up. It's like, well, I think that helped us a lot. And going into the uh, reunion thing, I, I, basically it was Andrew's idea a lot because he, he was the one who left the band. So he wanted like a closure kind of moment, whatever. So I, I was ready to do like that for him in, you know, in, if nothing else. And it turned out to be like a, this really cool ride especially very emotional at that point because we knew it was just that summer you know we were <laughs> honoring the statement that we're never going to do something more again so for us it, it was real you know that very emotional shows where you know you knew that this is the last time you connect with these people so that was super cool i like it and then now it's three albums down i think i'm like musical achievements that I've done, I think the comeback with the world reality is like the one that I'm most proud of. I'm not saying it's the, the best at the Gates album, of course it's this one, <laughs> but you know, it, just the pressure that we were working under a little bit was immense. And but some of those songs are now like staples in the live set that people enjoy a lot. That's, that means a lot to me. I think it's interesting you brought up recording this album right now was the first time you didn't feel pressure since reuniting of course because at war is the comeback album and then it's you're doing your first album without a principal songwriter it's like there are a lot of eyes on you i can only imagine the pressure creating at war 19 years after you know all the hype is built on slaughter the soul everyone's talking about the lore as we discussed what does that do to you internally emotionally mentally as a band as a group that pressure how did that affect you guys during the at war sessions it was very interesting because we actually did it in secrecy. It was, you know, we didn't even tell some of our closest friends what we were doing because we didn't want any outside pressure whatsoever. I think there was like, except family members, maybe five people who knew that we were doing it. That was a way for us to cope with it. If it doesn't come out the way that we wanted to come out, that we are, if we're not proud of it, at the end of the day, we will not release it. <laughs> so it was basically one, one and a half year of work that we didn't know if it was going to be fruitful. When we had like five songs, like, demoed we were like okay yeah, this, this is gonna work <laughs> but still it wasn't we were nervous you know it's uh on the world with reality we, maybe we were a little bit safe on some parts you know having a bit more modern mix and so on so i think to drink was a, like a reaction against that like a little more old school at the gates record versus the nightmare of being you're saying now it's like it's musically just total total freedom and and a much more relaxed the first time since the reunion you said that you're really relaxed making making a record it was so much fun to go in with that kind of like, there's no, no boundaries. Let's see where we can go with this. Of course, you know, if we tested, like for example, the saxophone, if it didn't come out well, we wouldn't, we, we would scrap the idea, of course. But, you know, it's kind of like still like daring to experiment. I, I love that. And it's, it's very rewarding when, it, when it's fruitful as an as a artist, I guess, you know, just to be able to, go out on a limb a little bit, like stretch your neck out a little bit. Yeah. And see what happens. I love that. It's a great answer. Let's talk about life and work. And there's a lot of musician friendly jobs in the world that a lot of, you know, our peers adopt uh, bartenders, chefs, uh, you know, working in a music store, but not you. Oh no, not <laughs> you. Um, how, how do you get interested in education uh, as, as a metal musician and ultimately end up being a social studies teacher? I think actually in Sweden, it's a lot of um, metalheads working in like care in general from, you know, elderly care, uh, taking care of kids at the kindergarten or working as like the, you know, the health teacher, the one that, you know, 
has to go out with uh, uh, with the ADD kid from the room, kind of and yeah. sit somewhere else. That's a lot of metalheads do that. Those kind of works. Because that's also a job you can quit and you can still come back to. I did go uh, do that, like the school thing, a little bit. I had a very good uh, teacher in in the class I was working with, and he he saw that I was interested. In like you know like if I connected with the kids and like like he saw how I felt when I actually learned them something. So I, I tried it a little bit and I really felt comfortable. And then I just decided, let, let's go to university five years. <laughs> so, but now, having been a teacher for 10 years, it's very rewarding, so to say, to, to actually inspire the kids, get them, you know, encourage them. Are there ever int- interesting moments where it's like, you know, M- Mr. Lindbergh has to, has to leave now for tour. And, uh, you know, like, how do you explain that? Do you Do you explain that to the kids that, you know, you're leaving for tour and you're going to go play to all these people and then, you're going to come back and resume studies after after the tour. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have to. I mean, and then the school I've been working on uh, at now for a while, it's the same school. So everybody knows that this is what I do as well. And I always talk to the boss before the school year starts. Okay, th- these are kind of the periods that I might, might have to go away. But we, we have so such a big teacher shortage in Sweden. They need me more <laughs> than I need them, I guess, you know. Indisposable indisposable so basically we get like a fill-in teacher for a couple of weeks i plan everything if they do a test i correct the test on tour <clears throat> last two u.s tours i did i was uh working one hour a day uh correcting stuff and also putting uh lectures up on uh google classroom You're like sitting on the bus with your laptop like working yeah yeah <laughs> so i actually got 25 percent pay during the tour for doing that Double dipping. That's awesome. That must go well with the $6 per diem that we get while we're on tour, right? Yeah, exactly. That we spend <laughs> on records. Yeah. Yes. Uh, just at all the record shops. You know, I'm a massive At The Gates fan, but I've always admired uh, you specifically, your connections to punk and hardcore. Can you offer any updates on other projects, whether it be Lockup or Disphere, or perhaps there's something in the works we don't know about? What's What's next for you outside of At The Gates? Both The Lurking Fear and Lockup albums are recorded and go, going to be released this year somehow in the fall, I think. They're both recorded and mastered and done, so that's great. This year, uh, we have uh, an album full of material now. So we're just kind of like nailing down the last things. We're doing pre-productions. Uh, right now, shopping around, looking for who's going to produce it. Nice. So that's probably going to be recorded sometime end this year, I hope. You know, I was hoping for to get four records out in one year, but... Yeah, what can you do? Three. <laughs> you got to adopt some pessimism when you're looking at how many records you're going to uh, put out in a year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> pessimism, the last refuge of hope. What about At The Gates? So we've got new record out. We've got shows booked. Are we, are we going to be making up some of those slaughter anniversary shows? What's, what's the release plan and, and what's uh, getting back on tour look like for you right now? I think we have around like five or six shows that are not yet canceled this year like from August to, say, October. Uh, we have started booking uh, from December onwards. So 2022 looks pretty full because we all also have those postponed re, uh, Slaughter of the Soul anniversary shows as well in between. So we, get, we have to like have a lot of songs fresh in our heads at the same time, but it's going to be fun. And I mean, we're lucky that Slaughter of the Soul is the 30 minutes. So basically we can play 30 minutes Slaughter of the Soul and side a of this <laughs> you have to do side a because i need to hear that sax live yeah what, what, what how are you going to do that how are we going to do that i think that you know uh, a lot of the orchestrational parts for to bring from the night itself we actually used some backing tracks for some of them uh roadburn of course we, we brought in joe quail's uh quarter for that we we are, we are thinking of doing like some shows where we can do the full thing you know and also then bring the sax player out as well so that's that's going to be played once in a while with special occasions when we can fly him out basically i love that death metal and live saxophone on the same stage is one of the most beautiful things ever i will come to gothenburg just for that show like that's that's huge <laughs> okay. for me man i love that that's great now i i, I think the saxophone has a very desperate tone we, we always talked a lot about the different uh, emotional tones of, of different instruments and how we can make the emotional impact on the listener greater with adding different instruments than just the basic death metal uh, lineup, so to say. So I think that's why we want to incorporate more and more stuff. 
to just hit the listener harder with the emotional side of the music. I love it. And, and I've listened to the, the new record numerous times. Uh, it's as an at the gates fan, I'm, I'm very pleased and I can't wait for everyone else to hear it because they are going to be very pleased as well. I hope so. I mean, there's a lot of surprises, but, uh, as I said, I think that average at the Ace listener is in, you know, they like surprises. Thomas, it's always fun to hang out with you. Thank you so much uh, for hanging. The Nightmare of Being, Century Media, everyone pick it up. Uh, go see At The Gates Live. And uh, dude, great shirt. Great shirt, man. Thank you so much. See you soon.